Now, does your heart hunger for the righteousness of God? Is it even possible for my garbage heart to take on or to understand or to reach out for, to get a piece of the righteousness of God? It seems like an impossibility. Uh, our weakness, it says, finds us falling before the throne. And I talked to you last week about some folks, St. Augustine, Martin Luther, John and Charles Wesley, John Bunyan, who read this book of Romans, their life was changed, and not only was their life changed, but the world was changed. Honestly, the world was changed. All of Britain and England, influenced by John Wesley and Charles Wesley, by the events that took place in their life, that have spawned the Reformation through Martin Luther forward and then the inspiration of the many churches. Many of the churches that are in our towns today came out of the movement of grace that they felt whenever they read through the book of Romans. I wanted to say something special to you today. It's not that special necessarily, but I had a dream the other night and uh, my dream was that we had church and I'd been, and I, I didn't feel... Uh, anything in the midst of the dream that was like, I'm doing this for Michael or I want to build an empire or anything because there's nothing about that. But I was teaching the Word of God and, and I was ready to teach the Word of God that Sunday and, and there was uh, 40 or 50 people that showed up for church that day and there was a, a small group of people. The rest of the auditorium was just empty and there's small group of people over here and, and, and I in the midst of that, I, I, I was grieving in the middle of the dream to say, Lord, does no one want to hear the truth from your word? And, and is no heart or people ready? And it, it was probably a picture of how our world, even in our religious world, gets farther and farther away from the truth. I know that there's one thing we can never compromise, and that's the truth of the word. But it's not always easy to see. I wanted to say thank you for being here today. And for my dream not to be true this Sunday. <laughs> but but I, I realize that if, they're, if we're actually preaching or teaching the Word of God, and you're going to see this in the next week, in two weeks, in three weeks, because the very next section in Romans actually says this is right and this is wrong. This is God and this is, uh, this is things of man. It's, there's actually some very strong, very powerful words from the Lord uh, washed through by His grace. Um, to show the integrity of God, the justice of God, and, and that, that God is never changing. He has been and he always will be. Right is right and wrong is wrong in the eyes of the Lord. And those things are going to remain that way through his word. But it's not easy to see that or to take that or to, to share that. Have you ever had to share with somebody that, uh, I don't know if any of you are bosses where you had to fire somebody, uh, but you bring them in and, and if, if you brought them in and the first things that they hear you say is, you have been a great worker here. <laughs> you know there's something wrong. They're trying to build you up and then they put it in the past tense. Go ahead and put on you, I just been fired face because you know that's about to come. You have, we have, we have, oh, we could, I don't know what we would have done without you, but we're going to have to now. But, um, so if you're going to, if you're going to share corrective words, even if you're going to correct your children, sometimes you might say, you know that I love you, but... We just, we need you to start making your bed, honey. We want to teach you to be a good boy in one day. To, I don't know what things you might share, but you want to encourage them first of all. Hey, did any of you ever wreck your car whenever you were a late teenager or something like that? I did. And I, um, I would call my dad and know that, know that there was bad news. I was about to tell him. I would, I, I would call him and, and like I was on my way to school at the college or whatever. And he'd know that's not a time that Michael ought to call. This is before cell phones. You had to get into somebody's house or something to get phones back then. Um, I mean, it was it's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. But, uh, you know, around 81 or something, I had a brand new, 80, 81, I had a brand new Buick Regal. Nice car back then. And, uh, and a lot of people didn't, a lot of young people didn't have those, but I did. And I was purchasing that myself. My daughters aren't here, but I would have told them that. But um, so I, 
the roads were wet. Somebody stopped in front of me somehow. I put on my brakes, slid right into him. Probably needed different tires or something like that. So I called my dad. I wanted to give him the bad news, but I had to tell him, first of all, well, Dad, I'm, I'm having a good morning. He goes, what's wrong? I said, well, I'm great. I'm, the car's not so good, <laughs> and uh, I need you to come pick me up. If you ever have to call your parents about a wreck... Don't start with, I've been in an accident, because that scares the poop out of them. You need to start with, and you will do this, I know, but you need to start with, hey, I'm okay, and everything's fine, but I've got some news about my car. Paul was actually stepping in to this book, and this is kind of the second part of the introduction where he's reaching out to the people, and he does this by building them up. Now, in those first eight verses, he was introducing himself, he was introducing Jesus, he was introducing God, he was introducing himself as a servant and an apostle of Christ in that order, and then he talked about who he is writing to. Now, he's addressing those that his letter is to. Now, he's not, he didn't ever say in Romans in the same way, I'm writing to the church at Rome, like there was a big old church at Rome at the time. In fact, there were Christians at Rome, but there wasn't an established church. There are some history uh, people in certain uh, denominations that would tell you, well, this church was started by uh, the apostle Peter. This book is going to tell us Peter did not start the church at Rome. It was already there, probably because there were some people who are listed in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost, it says there were others there from Rome, and they probably went back home, and they, they said, how do we worship this one in spirit and in truth? And they were trying to learn. But Paul says in this book that he said, I am writing to you not because you have had someone to teach you the truth, an apostle, but he said, I'm not going to build on another man's foundation, and I'm writing to you because there is no foundation there. So, He's writing to individuals as a group. If I told you, if when I preach to you sometimes, uh, some folks come up to me and they'll say afterwards, you were preaching right to me, but the message was from God's word and it was, it was to everybody there, but it was personal. There are some things he's going to say this morning that are clearly personal. And I pray that by the end of this service, as we take the Lord's Supper, the communion with the Lord, recognizing his Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that it will be very personal to you. So these things that are given to the whole are also opportunities for every person. Let's get right into the Word so we can get to the end. Romans chapter 1, verse 8 through 17, Paul said, first of all, now, he's buttering them up. I want to give you the good news before I tell you you're fired. <laughs> he, he, we're not even going to get to the fired part today. But he said, first of all, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. I thank my God through Jesus for y'all. If he was from the south, he'd have said y'all instead of all of you. He said, because, and this is why I thank my God for you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. All over the world. Now, he didn't say, I thank you for serving God. He said, I thank God for you. Because the praise always goes back to God. Everything should go back to God. I thank God. Not even saying I thank you for that. And the faith, their faith was, was being reported. Uh, not that they were closet Christians like I talked about at the beginning of the service. Are you a closet Christian? And some folks find out you're a Christian just by osmosis because you don't say bad words. Are you a Christian because you don't talk like everybody else? Well, yes, I am. Sometimes that may take place and that's a great thing. But the fact is... These folks needed to be and wanted to be, should be, just like us, need to be bold for Christ because time is short. Somehow they were either boldly growing for Jesus or they were, they were serving. And their servanthood was something that was evident that wasn't of this world. They were serving self-sacrificially. They were giving, not because they had a whole bunch of plenty. They were giving because they loved. And their love was evident that they had received love and they were passing that out somehow. So I was wondering, does our church reflect those things? Would we be able to say, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, for y'all, because your faith is being reported? Is the faith or this family at the Cowboy Church of Venice being reported anywhere? And if so, what is the report? Do you hear about the church in the community? Uh, Somebody tell me, what do you hear about the Cowboy Church of Venice in the community? If you've told somebody you go to the Cowboy Church of Venice, what did they say? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They don't know me very well. What she said was that she's heard several people say they love 
the pastor here. I, I am undercover all the time out of this. But now, um, sometimes they might say, I've heard of or I love the preacher or something because they've heard you somewhere. What other things would you hear about the family whenever you go out and about? Thank you, Deborah. What else have you heard? Yes, ma'am. A wonderful youth program. We do have a wonderful youth program, and I'm grateful for Corey. He, he is focused and doing an amazing job in that. What else? Family. Friendly. <laughs> I'm sorry, what were you saying? Ooh, that was it. That's like in stereo from one side and the other. One of the most friendly, loving churches. That's what she said also, friendly. But I was, I was catching both of those. Friendly church. Listen, what does... This church, or these people at Rome were known for something. I know that there are people around this city who recognize many of you as servants of Christ because of your hands of service or because of your, your giving heart. Because you, they know that if you say that you're going to pray for them, that there are prayers that are lifted up. And there are prayer requests that come to our church and through our church from a lot of different places nowadays. Um, could we be drawn then, if, if Paul was asking these people who were good people, whose faith was being known about all over the world, he was drawing them to say, I want you to be even a greater harvest. Now what he was going to do was start to, if you were seeing it like a farmer, he was taking the land, he was going to till the land, and in weeks ahead we're going to be tilling the land, tilling our church spiritually, emotionally, that we can start planting things that are going to bear good fruit. Now Paul said, I want to see a harvest take place. And that means that the land needs to be prepared for that. And Paul said, I want to be the one who's going to get and, and enjoy the harvest along with you. In verse 9, he said, God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel to, my, to his son, about his son rather, the gospel of God's son is my witness. God whom I serve is my witness. That word serve there is the same word that's used for worship. In Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul, in this same book, said, I urge you as brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your true and proper worship or your spiritual act of service. It's service and worship. I the most profound definition of the word worship that I ever found had only two words in it. Most profound definition of worship had two words in it. One of them was to bow and the other to serve. Sometimes our worship is bowing down to Christ, bowing down to God, either in prayer, um, in, in seeking forgiveness, in singing songs, in, in something else that's corporatively done like this in church. But if, if half of your worship to God is not done in service and putting your hand to the plow and meeting the other needs of people in being the hands of Jesus because that's the way he set it up, then you're not worshiping. If you only worship or somebody only knows that you're a Christian when you're at church, you're not worshiping actually. He said, the God whom I serve or whom I worship in my service to God through preaching about his son, this is what might anger you. And I, I wrote this down as a direct quote. There, was, there are preachers who are teaching the opposite of this uh, today. And maybe even saying something like this today. Because very recently, very recently, uh, someone before a large congregation said these words. I just want to encourage every one of us to realize when we obey God, we're not doing it for God. I mean, that's one way to look at it. We're doing it for ourselves because God takes pleasure when we're happy. That's what that preacher said. That's the thing he gives the, that gives him the greatest joy. So I want you to know this morning, just do good for your own self. Do good because God wants you to be happy. When you come to church, when you worship him, you're not doing it for God really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Amen? Do you agree with my ignorant words? Amen. They said that before... Not just a small congregation, not just a large congregation, but something that was televised that, that the world would hear that God doesn't matter, we matter. That we worship for ourselves because, because God wants us to be happy. Where do you find this in the Word of God? 
I went to Matthew chapter 6. I went to John 12. I went to several places. One of the places in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus himself, who is God in the flesh, said, when you pray, he said, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in synagogues in front of people on street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. When you pray, you do it to the Father. When you worship, you worship to God. I urge you, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Not to be glorified or edified, but to be sacrificed. When something is sacrificed, it dies. It dies to itself so that something else, someone else can be glorified. This is your only holy, true, proper act of worship. Your only true, proper act of integrity or service, reasonable service to God. And he said the way to do this is don't conform to the pattern of this world that glorifies and edifies men, but be transformed from the inside out by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. You won't even know God's will if your mind is not first in tune with him. But if you do these things, you will test and prove what God's will is, his pleasing and perfect will. So Paul said in verse 9, and I'll read that first part again, God whom I worship or I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, he's my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. It's possible that the people at Rome knew that it was not very many years earlier, Acts chapter 7 records it, how Paul was the inspiration to the the stoning, the murder of a disciple named Stephen. One of those who was a, a, a bold, pure servant of Christ. And, and Stephen's sermon is even uh, laid out there, how, how strong it is. And Paul was over there, and it was, it was Paul that, that was giving the approval to the murder of Stephen. Paul not only murdered Stephen or was involved with that, he didn't lift a rock, by the way, himself. He was the one who was over the side giving the orders. He also separated families. He's the same guy... That, that Christians were scared of all over. They were scared to death of Paul because he was a wicked, evil, mean, and nasty man. Now, he was sending this letter, and he said, I know that you may not believe me. I know that you may not trust me, but I want you to know, as God is my witness, God is my witness, I care about you, I love you, I pray for you, and I constantly remember you in my prayers. And God is the only one that matters. But I'm telling you that God knows what I'm telling you is true. He had to establish, first of all, his love for these folks. Sometimes I've said uh, in a sermon or something else, as God is my witness, this is a fact. As God is my witness. In other words, whether you believe it or not, this is a truth. We don't swear by God or by men. We don't make uh, idle promises. But God is watching. And we can say, as God is my witness, this is a fact that I'm sharing with you before this place. The gospel of his son, he said, I preach the gospel of his son does not end with salvation. In fact, he's going to talk a lot about the gospel and this gospel is given to Christians. It's given to believers, to those who are already saved. If you're already saved, why do you need the gospel? Sometimes we thought the gospel is just evangelistic. To accept Jesus Christ, hear the gospel about his life, his death, his resurrection, and then you'll be a done deal. But Paul said you as Christians need something more. We need to grow up in him. It's like when we accept Christ, we have a foundation, which is Jesus Christ. But we can't build on this foundation unless the land is tilled. Unless there's something that starts to bear fruit and starts to grow in us that gives a harvest. It'd be like us adopting a child and saying, congratulations, little Johnny, Bobby, whatever your name is. Uh, little Drew. Do we have any Drews? In? Drew? Congratulations, little Drew. Uh, you used to be Drew Smirlikoff. Now you're Drew Howard. We adopt you into the family. And then we go, congratulations, you're part of the family. Psh, have a good life. And we walk away from him. Would that be a good thing to do? That's what we do as Christians. And that's what some people think the Bible or the gospel is. <clears throat> Once you accept Christ, it's a done deal. We're covered and we're done. We are done, but that child needs to be brought up. That child needs to be fed. That child needs to be nurtured. That child needs to be trained. And God said, 
We as a church need this time because this is the bringing up that we as a foundation, as a ground, might bear harvest for the sake of Christ. We need this. And Paul knew that he needed it so much that he, as a spokesperson on behalf of the Holy Spirit, sent this letter, not just to that church, but to us today as Christians. We need to realize that the best really is yet to come. There's a passage in Philippians that talks about the continuation of the gospel. And the reason I share this is once we accept Christ, he is not done with us. He doesn't adopt us and then kick us to the side. He says one day there's going to be a resurrection. In fact, the full gospel says that the blood of Jesus Christ, the bloodline of Christ began in Genesis chapter 1. And I could prove this to you over time. I could prove it to you quickly, but I'm not going to do it right now. In Genesis chapter 1, and as you walk through the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the picture that was given of faith in the Old Testament, you'd find that Jesus Christ was evident through that whole thing. And then you get to the New Testament, which is today, which we're living in today, the message to the church and to the believers. But it talks also about something yet to come. It talks about things going on in heaven now and it talks about Jesus coming back and it talks about him establishing his throne on this earth it talks about an eternity a new heaven and a new earth yet to come and the inheritance that goes on for eternity see the gospel covers all of those things it covers the past it covers the present and it covers the future the gospel is not just the word about Jesus life while he was here so when Paul wrote to another church in a town called Philippi in Philippians chapter 3 verse 7 through 14 come in close to this for just a second verse 7 of Philippians chapter 3 says Paul said whatever were gains to me in this world I count them lost for the sake of Christ in fact I consider everything lost I consider it garbage everything of this world is going to burn up which means it's just like garbage to me compared to the surpassing worth or value of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord It's for his sake that I lose all things. I'd give up everything that I could gain Christ, that I could be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. And that's one of the reasons I chose that. Righteousness. Again, we see the righteousness that comes through from God through Jesus Christ. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes through my own works, but that that is through faith in Christ. This righteousness comes from God on the basis of faith. Am I applying to my life The righteousness of God through my trusting him to walk forward, trusting him. Paul said, I want to know Christ, to know the power of his resurrection, even to participate him in his sufferings, becoming like him even in his death, somehow so that I could attain to the resurrection from the dead, a choosing even out from among the dead, a particular word there we've talked about on Monday nights with the men's Bible study, the not just the resurrection, but the resurrection and the choosing of those who would reign with him out of those who were the Christians, those who would have been seen worthy of taking on responsibility. Paul said in verse 12, I haven't obtained this already. Not that I already have obtained all this or have already reached my goal, for I have not. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He saved me for a purpose. He saved me for something yet to come. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. And Paul said, but one thing I do, I forget what is behind and I strain towards what is ahead. I live in the present, but I'm not living based upon the past because I'm looking forward to the future. I strain towards what is ahead and I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me in heaven. Which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The prize is in heaven. The prize is not just salvation. The prize is not just to live a good life. The prize is not just to worship because God wants you to be happy. If, if, if my salvation and our life was based upon, if God's gift of salvation was based upon just us being happy or rich or, or powerful, that's weak. Those things end. All, all it takes for the rich, the powerful, those who who have a a lot of authority, responsibility, or popularity, all it takes for that to go away in their own mind is for them to be told, you have three months to live. And all those things don't matter anymore. They know they're not going to take those things with them. They might try to still base their life or their value on those things that they lived for of value. But the fact is, those things seem very, very empty at that time because there's no promise of a future. There's no promise of heaven in those things. So Paul said, I am praying for you. I'm remembering you in my prayers. God is my witness to this. And I pray now 
that now at last, by God's will, that I can come, the way may be open for me to come to you. But not my will. He said, it's by God's will. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done in Luke 22, 42. And Paul got that. He said, it's my desire, but I want to do God's will. Verse 11 says, I long to see you in person so that, so that I may give to you or impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Was the you there? Was it singular? I want to give to you something to make you strong. I want to give to you a spiritual gift. Well, he's talking to believers which means he was talking to a group of people. So, so the you was plural. Do you think he was going to give one spiritual gift to all of those people? In Romans chapter 12, he went on, and I've used Romans chapter 12 a couple of times, but in Romans chapter 12, he talks about some of the gifts that he was going to pour out to this church. He said, uh, we, like a body, have many different functions, many different members. We have arms, we have legs, we have eyes, we have noses. Um, we have things that we didn't even know we needed, but God knew that we needed them for some reason, like that little hanging down punching bag thing in the back of your throat. I don't know what it's for, but it's there for a reason. Uh, in Romans 12, 4 through 8, he said, some of you are that little hanging down punch ball thing in the back of your throat. He said, just like a body has many different functions and members, we as a church also have that. In Christ, we, though many, form one body and each member belongs to the others. We have differing gifts. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy or share the, what is to come in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, serve. Serve with your hands for the sake of Jesus Christ. If it's teaching, then teach, but teach with integrity. If it's encouraging, give encouragement to people because people need that. If it's giving, and these are the gifts that he gave. If it's giving, give generously. If it's leading, lead with integrity. Do it diligently. Don't stop. And don't lead off the wrong path. If it's mercy, show mercy to those who need mercy. Verse 11 and 12 there said, I long to see you so that I may give to you, impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. He didn't talk about giving them, he, Paul was not so proud. He had the ability to raise a man named Eutychus from the dead. He didn't even say, God, if it be your will, may Eutychus rise up from the dead. Paul said, well, I preached too long and he fell out of the window <laughs> and he's dead. And the Bible said he was dead, but Paul said he's going to rise up again. And Paul raised him up again. Paul had the ability to do miracles because Jesus had instilled that in him as the last apostle to do miracles at his discretion. In other words, God had empowered him in that way. But Paul wasn't saying, I'm going to come show you a miracle. I'm not going to come give you a gift in order to build myself up or to build you up. He said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to empower you to strengthen you as a body, to strengthen you as a church. And the gifts that were given in Romans chapter 12 did not include signs, wonders, and miracles. Didn't include those gifts of, of healing or the gifts of speaking in tongues or the gift of interpretation of tongues. Those gifts <clears throat> that had to do with miracles were given to the Jews. The Jews demanded a sign and they received that. I think it's 1 Corinthians 3 says that. It might have been 2 Corinthians 3, but the fact is that the Jews demand a sign, but the Gentiles are seeking something else. Those Christians, not just Gentiles, but Christians are seeking something else, and that is to reign with Christ. Paul's message was clear and his goal was set. And so he said, I'm giving you these gifts to strengthen this church, that you may be mutually encouraged by one another's faith. In other words, built up in one another's faith, verse 12 said. Verse 13 says, I don't want you to become unaware, brothers and sisters. I planned many times to come to you. I planned many times, but I'd been prevented so until now. Boy, would you not believe what I went through? I was almost killed. I was almost uh, cast out at sea alone. I've gone through beatings. I've gone through prisons and things. I want to come to you in order that I may have a harvest among you. And this is where I got that word harvest. I want to come to where you are because I know that, that I'm not going to build on another man's foundation because there hasn't been an apostle come to share with you the gospel, the understanding of the past present and the future, the faith that the Jewish nation walked in, in in complete subjection to God, even though they stumbled at times, God was faithful in the midst of them and they were called to be faithful back to him. Paul said, I've learned about that faith. I want to have a harvest among you just as I have had among many others, many other Gentiles. A harvest among Christian believers? See, we think that the word harvest has to do with just accepting Christ. Well, the, the Jesus said, the fields are white unto harvest. 
I need laborers to go out and to call in, to bring in the sheaves. The fact is, he talked about harvest being salvation, but here he's saying harvest concerning salvation was only the beginning. There is more, and I need you to grow up in him. I am giving you this second week of introduction that we can grow up in him in the understanding of the things that he has for us through this book. I want to harvest among many. I want you to bear fruit. When is harvest season? Fall. Why is harvest season in fall? Why isn't it in the early summer? Because there's nothing growing yet. We wait until harvest time. That's why we have uh, Thanksgiving because the harvest brings in the fruit. When he was saying, I, I desire a harvest, he's saying, I desire to bring in the fruit. Now, I was wondering, what are the fruits? Because he talked about how he serves out of the Spirit. And I thought, the fruit of the harvest must be the fruits of the Spirit. I went to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 to see this. And, and let's just take a test. Are the fruit of the Spirit, or the harvest of the Spirit being evident in us? Here's the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Do you have love? Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Did you know that those were harvest pieces? Those are fruit of harvest that we can have any day. Any day that you, you share love to anyone, someone who's in a nursing home, someone who is in the nursery from the birth all the way to, to coming home to be with Jesus, we can share these fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit ought to flow through us, and it can flow through us, which means the words that he gave to the church at Rome are words that we can and should be uh, obligated also to today. Paul had an obligation. He said, I'm committed to this, 14 through 17, verses 14 through 17 of Romans 1. Paul said, I'm obliged or obligated both to the Greeks and to the non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, all kinds of people, sophisticated and unsophisticated, intelligent and those, those who are lacking intelligence. Um, when you were a child, I don't know if this is a word that's being used today. Y'all can tell me if you've ever heard this word before when I get done. If we were, uh, if, if, if there was an individual who exercised a bodily function outside of a place that ought to be exercised, um, my dad might say, Michael, you're... No, not me. He might say, uh, he might say that was uncouth. Have any of y'all heard uncouth? Have y'all ever heard uncouth? Well, that's un... Yeah, that was... One of you has. That was uncouth of you. That was, that was lacking sophistication. Here's the good news. Jesus came for the uncouth. Amen, Doug. He came for those who are, no, no, I'm, I want an affirmation from a brother and an elder of mine. He came for those of us who, who are sophisticated, and he came for those of us, he came for everybody. Verse 15 says, that's why I'm so eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I know that we all need it, and this gospel is preached to the Christians. He says, this is to saints in the Lord, believers in Jesus Christ, he says in those early verses. Why do Christians need the gospel? What is the gospel? It, it includes all of these things that we talked about. We need the gospel. This is the full gospel. I've had people say, are y'all a full gospel church? I say, we sure are. We haven't torn anything out of this book. What they sometimes are asking if you're a full gospel church because that's been coined by a particular group that says we can exercise the apostolic gifts. In other words, we can heal people or we can speak in tongues at our discretion and we can do it whether it fits into the scripture or not. We do it maybe as a whole church, though the scripture gives another outline for that. But if they say, are you a full gospel church, they might be asking, are you part of this full gospel denomination? But the fact is, this gospel, this full gospel, this entire gospel is given for us. It's given for all all of us. It may not be written exactly to us. I don't have to go to the temple to make sacrifices anymore. I don't have to sacrifice sheep to get forgiveness of sins because the last lamb was sacrificed. That was the son of God and I believe in him. I accept him and I'm part of the family of God before, because of that. So I'm so eager to preach the gospel, verse 15 says, to you who are in Rome. Verse 16 says, and I, in fact, am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. This is where it starts, through becoming a child of God. 
But in this gospel, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, which means after salvation, we are called to his righteousness. We are called not just to receive it, but that it would flow through us, that we would be the hands of God to serve, that we'd be the encouragement to those who need encouragement, that we would be those, those who share the, the gifts of God through the fruit of the Spirit. Righteousness of God means God's ability to save all mankind. But listen to this. The righteousness of God also means the perfect integrity of God. He will not go against what he says. And we're going to talk about in weeks ahead some of the things that he said that are not easy to swallow in a culture like our godless culture today. But the justice of God is just as pure. It's just as pure for him to not waver on those things that are right in his eyes or wrong in his eyes. God's justice is not a welcoming thing if you've never accepted Christ. God's justice means you get to go to hell. But God's righteousness to those who are believers means not only do we get to have heaven, not only do we joy, enjoy the family and the support of the Holy Spirit, the comforter guiding us through the trials of this life, but we also have an inheritance because we're children of God. We receive from the Father in heaven when we get there one day. The eternal blessing with the eternal benefits to an eternal believer is the righteousness of God flowing through us. A righteousness, he says in those last words, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. From faith to faith, the faith of the Jewish nation, the covenant, the old covenant, to the new covenant. And it goes on into eternity. And it's written for those of all times, past, present, and future. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Through Christ we are righteous. We must live like it. We must live like it. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I want to read some verses for you. And if you want a copy of these, you may have them. Romans 3.23, I'm going to read from the book of Romans. Romans 3.10 says, There's none of you who are righteous. There's none of you who are righteous, not even one. I'm not righteous either. Though I am made righteous or saved because of Jesus Christ, there's none of us who are righteous. And the reason I'm not righteous is because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 says. And Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death for me and for you, but the gift of God is eternal life. If we place our trust in Jesus Christ and his righteousness, his sinless life is washed down to me and I'm forgiven because he never sinned, but he took on death for my sake. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated or poured out his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, yet sinners, Christ did die for us. He loved mankind who could not have any righteousness on their own. Romans 10, 13 tells us how to be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Acts chapter 6, verse 31 says, that's the message in this last eight or ten minutes. I, I pray that, that we can come to a spot where we can commune, talk with. Somehow, and not as a group, but you as an individual, somehow can get in tune with God. That takes place when we ask forgiveness of those things that are in our life that are sinful. I don't want you to raise your hand, but if there's any of you in this room who think right now all of your sins have been forgiven, they have been forgiven. But if you're still carrying some of the garbage of life, you're not alone. Every person in this room still has unconfessed sin that they need to say, Jesus, you know I keep struggling with this. Jesus, you know I've never asked you forgiveness for that. Jesus, I want you to wash through me today because I want to taste your righteousness that by your grace, maybe people could see that on my face one day. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have prayer before we call the men forward who will help us in passing out this Lord's Supper today. But my prayer is that you would envision the cross of Jesus Christ, the fact that when he died on the cross, he had your face and your actions. He had the worst of my sins on his mind. And yet he spread out his hands willingly and had them nailed to that cross knowing that he was going to die. The worst part, I think, wasn't his death for him. The worst part was tasting sin that he had never tasted before. And it was yours and mine. And that's what this time is all about that we do in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for your love that is such a self-sacrificial love 
that you laid down your life for us. The juice that we drink in a moment, this, this grape juice that is representative of, of the grapes that had the skin around them holding the juice in, but they were crushed. And then the juice flowed out. It's just like you were crushed for my sin, crushed for my iniquity. And, but by your stripes, I'm healed. It was your blood that was poured out that we recognize in the midst of your table today, Lord, that you ask us to do in remembrance of you. For the, the bread where you said, I am the bread of life, for the bread that we take in today, you said, this is my body, I'm the bread of life, and, and this is symbolic of my body broken for you. And my skin, my body was broken for you, though no bro bones were broken. The fact was, your body was completely poured out and wasted for me. Poured out. For my sake, Jesus, may everyone in this room who has accepted you as Savior realize that gift. And if anyone has not accepted you, even as I pray right now, may they say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I know that you were the Son of God. I know that you rose from the grave. I know that you did that for me. Jesus, I receive, I believe. I want to be a child of God too. Father, may this day be life-changing for all of us. Thank you for your gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If the men would come forward who are going to help us with the, the Lord's Supper today. Jesus told us to do this and to do it often. We may not do it often enough, but he didn't say how often to do it. But he said whenever you do it, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul, as taught by Christ, laid out what is supposed to take place. And this is what we're doing today and this is why we're doing it. Listen close to these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse um, 23. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed and taken to be crucified, that night he took bread, like this bread here that's broken. He took the bread and... and when he gave thanks, he broke the bread to the men and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you eat this bread in this way, with this mindset, you do it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. When you take this bread or you drink this cup, Remember that you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Verse 25 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's pray one more time. Thank you for your table. But more importantly than that, Lord, thank you for your life. Thank you that, that you came back out of that grave. And because of that, as sure as we live today, we, our bodies also will be coming out of the grave and, and our spirit, though, if we are dead today, we go to be with you because being absent from this body is being present with the Lord. And just like you said to that thief, the day that you die, today you'll be with me in paradise. But what you have for us, you've promised is even greater than that. A completion of the body, soul, and spirit being kept blameless and then glorified. And then an eternal heaven, a new heaven and a new earth that we get to experience together. Jesus, I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to remember you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take those and pass those down there. Thank you. Do these first. Here you go, Jonathan. Oh. Put those will slide. Savior say my strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin and stain he washed it white as snow Lord 
But now indeed I find Thy power in Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow. For the throne, I stand in Him complete. Thank you, Don. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips shall stand. As we've given thanks already, the Scripture says once He broke it, just as we've done symbolically here, He said, "This is my body. It's broken for you. When you eat it, take it in remembrance of me." In the same way, he passed out the cup. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as Sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me on the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood, he purchased me. With his blood, he purchased us. On the cross, he 
sealed my part Paid the debt and made me free I will tell the wondrous story How my lost estate to save Special morning. How the victory he gives. He gives victory over, over sin, the sin of this life, and death, and, and, death hell. and hell. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood, he purchased me. to sing of our name. It's personal. With his blood he purchased me on the cross. He said this is the cup of a new covenant that lasts through eternity. When you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Jesus, thank you for your life. Thank you for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. And thank you for the gift that you've given to us. May we reflect the righteousness of your sacrifice in the service of our hands and in the opportunity to share the gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you go.